friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences, where we are changing the culture one conversation at a time. We are the radio show and podcast of the Catholic Association. We address the issues that interest you, puzzle you, and flame you in the hope that we can bring some clarity, even to the darkest corners. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network, Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, or you can catch the encore at 5 p.m. We are also on Sirius XM Channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast. Go to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. Thank you for joining us this week on Conversations with Consequences. We'll be talking later on in the show with J.P. DeGantz. He leads Communio, which is a nonprofit that consults with churches to equip them with proven strategies and and technologies to solve the crisis in families that we're seeing in our pews and it's reflected in our faith. But first, we'll be talking to Don Johnson. He is a filmmaker and the director who just produced Disconnected, the real story behind the transgender explosion, revealing just how deeply entrenched this ideology is in our entire culture. Welcome to the show, Don. Thanks for having me on, Gracie. Don, you've uh, just completed a, a wonderful project, a feature-length movie called Disconnected, the real story behind the transgender explosion. Here on Conversations with Consequences, we talk about transgender ideology a lot from lots of different perspectives. And I, I feel, and I think a lot of my listeners feel, that it's it's one of the greatest travesties of our time. It It's sort of like the culminating peak of decades, uh, maybe more, of you know a total a total disconnect, <laughs> uh, if I can <laughs> right. say between between the true ideas of of our of our embodied selves and the ideas that the culture keeps promoting at a at a terrible pace and and we're sort of living this this giant climax right now. So thank you for making this film. Tell our listeners about about your film and and, uh, and how you approach this this transgender movement. Yeah, I think uh, that was a great introduction. I think that really encapsulates what we're trying to do and the story that we tell. I mean, you're right. It's decades in the making. And not only is it decades in the making, but it is decades in the making of an, an explicit attack against the human person. So, I mean, the way you frame that, I think, is, is correct. It's an anti-person, anti-human, anti-body, anti-family ideology that ha- has seeped through, you know, throughout the 20th century. I mean, they're age-old heresies, I think, but it's mm-hmm. seeped through throughout the 20th century from second wave uh, feminism to um, the gay rights movement to now this transgender thing and coming transhumanism, which, you know, and the pedophilia and all the stuff that's going to come along with that. That's what this movie's about. It's like, what's going on here? Especially we focus on teenage girls a lot uh, because that's really where it's, I think, hitting the most with social media and big pharma uh with a, an explicit attack uh, and selling to young girls. And so we tell the story, uh, it kind of actually follows the story of one young transitioner who very quickly realized after her double mastectomy that she had made a huge mistake and that she had been lied to. And so it took her a couple of years to sort of admit that, well, I, I, I need to turn this thing around. Uh, so we follow that story uh, through her transition and her detransition. And along the way, we talk to... I don't know, over 20 experts, you know, teachers, plastic surgeons, uh, psychologists, uh, public health people. So um, to get input into what exactly is going on. So, yeah, I think it turned out to be a, a pretty cool film. People have been really moved by it. They're usually crying at the end. And, uh, yeah, we've been very grateful for the reception that it's received. I watched the trailer and I'm very much looking forward to watching the movie. A couple of things that that struck me. First of all, that you used, um, you interviewed many experts and some of them in fields that seem to have been completely captured or almost completely captured by the by transgender ideology like um, psychotherapy and right. um, endocrinology you had a plastic surgeon um, yeah. and you probably have others that that weren't included on the trailer why is it important to uh, highlight these uh, experts that aren't going along that are bucking the trend yeah well I think people are somewhat unaware of just how um, overtaken our public institutions have been by this public education, the medical field. You talked about psychotherapy in California. Now it's basically illegal 
to practice traditional uh, therapy on kids. So cognitive behavioral therapy where, you know, like, for example, if you come in uh, traditionally with anorexia, we are going to realize that you've got some psychological issues, emotional problems that we're going to deal with, that your body is not, in fact, you know, wrong. There's nothing wrong with your body. You're not obese. And so we will try to uh, speak truth into that situation and get your thoughts lined up with reality. That type of therapy in regards to uh, sexual dysfunctions is now basically illegal in California. So you walk into a therapist today, say, I think uh, I my gender is different. They're not even allowed to look at all of the problems, all of the issues, the sexual trauma that you have in your past, at all of those things and apply it to the situation. So that's the kind of issue that, that people need to be aware of. I mean, that's the, that's the therapy field. But in the medical field, I mean, I talked to a medical school patient the other day who uh, was explaining how they were trying to examine a cadaver in medical school and, and none of the students were allowed to to say whether it was male or female. And I'm mean, like, well, I don't know if I'm going oh <laughs> to... I know gosh, I'm talking wait, to you've, it. You've totally, you've totally shocked me. <laughs> I didn't think I could I mean, be shocked. <laughs> well, I just, you know, and I'm like, well, what is going on with our, you know, as a doctor, you understand, like, this is, you know, like the uh, the interview we did actually with the plastic surgeon, Dr. Patrick Lappert, is one of the most um, compelling in the film. And he, he really walked us through, and I've actually got extra footage too <laughs> online because it was too much to even put in the movie, just how um, big of a travel travesty the uh, medical field is in many ways right now especially when it comes to uh, gender ideology that it's it's really upending at public schools you know we talked to several um, parents and public school teachers and just how much um, this ideology has basically overtaken uh, the public school system um, and it goes state by state I think but but in general parents need to be really aware that that this is a, a top-down thing you know this is not this is not a grassroots thing where there's a bunch of you know there's a bunch of kids suddenly realizing that they're trans no that it's being pushed on them this is this is being um there's a lot of people making a lot of money have a lot of power with a particular ideology that is pushing this through the institutions through social media that sort of thing and it's really like messed up <laughs> I, you know, I, I agree with you but many many people believe and maybe you can tell me why this isn't true since you've done this film and you've talked to so many experts many people believe that this is not uh, being pushed on children and young people but that this is something that is being uncovered because society is becoming more accepting of people whose sexuality is uh, very you know is diverse and doesn't follow the normal traditional heterosexual um, relations that you know that, that form the family for instance right and, right and that that and that people's understanding of their own sexuality does really have to do with maybe 172 genders and counting and these are just things that have been kept in a little tight little box because you know because we're all sour pusses I guess <laughs> yeah right and no I mean there's many many reasons to disbelieve that but one just real obvious one is that the people who are becoming transgender now and, and the media you know you see like the middle-aged men and that sort of thing that's not actually the major thing mm -hmm. it's the teenage girls right the teenage girls and, and traditionally like even gender dysphoria like the classical understanding of of being unhappy you know unhappy feeling disconnected from your body that would have been uh middle-aged men people who have autogynephilia who have a sexual dysfunction and very very small amount of, of young boys who would then grow out of it almost 100 percent of them by the time they hit puberty now it is almost entirely girls there's been a five thousand percent increase in the last few years of teenage girls who are claiming this and this has never been the group that would have identified with this uh if it was a social thing where it's you know it's like genetic and now people are being more comfortable you would see a rise in all groups coming out but you don't you see it's almost entirely middle age or teenage girls um so that that tells me that there's something else going on here right this is a sociological phenomenon it is uh, a trend in many ways it is um, a, a misdiagnosis <laughs> oftentimes of just you know teenage angst you know I explained like some of the factors autism 35 to 50 percent of girls who identify as trans are on the autism spectrum completely undiagnosed uh, in general from professional fields so yeah no this is not this is not a sudden awakening uh, of something that's always been there this is a new uh, social phenomenon that's being uh, 
pushed and funded by particular groups. I was a teenage girl at one time, and I've raised, I'm in the process of raising one. I, ra- I have one, a young adult daughter. And being, you know, puberty for a girl is a very difficult time. A girl goes yeah. from being sort of a steady, a steady little, a steady little child, uh, like like the boys in class, right? Just uh, yeah. in you know interacting with the world in a in a curious and and fun way, and then suddenly puberty hits you like a ton of bricks, and you you know your life becomes an emotional tornado because that's what puberty does. Suddenly you've got these <laughs> hormones surging through your body. Um, your body's doing all sorts of strange things that are uncomfortable and not um, pretty, uh, at least not to your pure, innocent, you know, ch- childish eyes. And then, yeah. and tell me if you feel like this is true, and then the the model of womanhood that you see in the culture for you, like the, the, the womanhood that you could claim, right, by going through normal yeah. female puberty, is just not that attractive. I mean, a woman uh, out there in the world, as soon as you, you go from child to, to, to woman, you become sort of a plaything of men. You have to... Um, you have to present yourself always, and you know if you're not attractive, you're 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 done. You're toast. Um, yeah. You know there's Instagram, and you always have to look beautiful in photos. And what? Why would a girl want to be a woman in a in a degraded culture like that? Do you think that's a, a big part of it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a major major factor. Uh, and I'm with you. I've I've working. We've had four. I've had four. Got four kids. Three teenage girls. One oh. just entering teenage. <laughs> <laughs> one just it. leaving. You're so, living it yeah. No, we got. I got. I got girls twelve to twenty one, and so that. That's one of the reasons I make these films. <laughs> yeah. but, but you're exactly right. You I mean, it's a very difficult society to live as a teenage girl. Throw on social media on top of all the sexual mm-hmm. objectification. Throw on um, the uh, sexual trauma that many girls are facing now in and, all areas of life. I mean, Don, you just want to opt out. And Don, this is not the case in your family. I'm, I'm probably, I'm very sure and not in mine, but a lot of girls don't have either, they don't know that a man can treat a woman like like, yeah. like a wife and, and be faithful to her. They've never yeah. seen it. They've never seen a man cherish a woman in real life. They see it maybe in the movies, though, although we don't see that very much in movies anymore. But a woman doesn't, a girl doesn't necessarily see like a safe place to dock her womanly boat. No, you're exactly right. The broken families, a lack of a father figure, uh, just a culture that sexually objectifies them, primarily sees them as objects for male pleasure. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. Who would want to be? Uh, a woman in that culture. And so this is absolutely one of the main reasons that girls are opting out. And it's completely, again, this is one of those things that's completely unrecognized by uh, therapists and doctors who are treating these girls. I, I, I talked to uh, a transitioner who had been in therapy for seven years and never once had been asked about the divorce they went through, the sexual trauma that they they were abused as a kid, like never once asked about any of these things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and it, how do you not? How are you not making these connections? And so, yeah, that's you're exactly right. Like, we need to recognize the society in which these kids are living in, the struggles that they are going through, and not make it worse by adding physical mutilation and lifetime of drug dependency on top of the pain that they're already experiencing. But John, you and I use words like physical mutilation and a lifetime of drug dependency. Those are very accurate words, but the, what they're seeing on Instagram, what they're seeing on the websites of certain cosmetic people, some, I hate to call them doctors, <laughs> cosmetic <Right>. doctors, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. cosmetic surgeons, what they're seeing are, you know, euphemistic happy terms like top yeah. surgery and, um, you know, just even the word transition, which sort of, which tells you, oh, you're, it's, you know, it's this sort of path you're going to travel and you're going to arrive safe and whole and beautiful on the other side. It's just a transition as though you yeah. were, you know, a butterfly going from cocoon, you know, to, from from worm to, to butterfly in your cocoon. Um, right. So there's a lot of uh, happy terms. Um being used for things that are very, very negative. You know, the on the trailer I saw the the, the woman, the detransitioner that you feature. I forget her Daisy, Daisy. I think Daisy. Yeah. Um, her voice is very low. She has the voice of a man, which 
maybe she'll never get back her female voice. She's been on testosterone. I, she was on testosterone for years. That's right. Yeah, the voice never comes back. The sexual function is never the same. Um, you are sterilized for the most part. Uh, this, the kids are being lied to. I mean, bottom line, the kids are being lied to. They're very ignorant about what actually happens. Um, you know, you can you can find Reddit forums of 40,000 uh, transitioners strong who are who are now moving to detransition. And some of, some of them are so sad. I saw a post uh, from a young girl. She's like, well, when do my boobs grow back? And, you know, they, they just they just don't know. They, this is permanent scarring. The voice. Yeah, the voice never changes. All of these things. You, you, you don't put puberty on pause. That's not a thing. No, OK, that's not a thing. Right? That's you not can pause thing. it, but then you better let it go normally or you're never going to get it back. You're never going to get your your, your ovaries are never yeah. going to develop your uterus. That's right. Your testicles will never grow. I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm being I'm being. No, medical. that's no, but th- me, those listeners. are the facts. <laughs> Like they're not they're not told these facts. They're they're they they are completely uh, ignorant. The the system is lying to them. Um, they are you know depressed. They they go in in a in a very you know fragile state emotionally, physically, and the doctors. I'm sorry to say, are just they're primarily writing check, like making money off of this. Yes, uh, the, it's the you know, days- gender industrial complex. Oh my gosh! I mean, the Daisy said she never said two words. Her plastic surgeon never said two words to her. It was just like a conveyor belt of girls going through that bit that day. She happened to be first in line, but there was, there she was very, you know, just sort of angry about it later. That um, my counselor, she realized later that her counselor actually had uh, misgivings about it, but she didn't want to lose her license. She didn't want to get in trouble professionally, so she just let her continue her her, her push. The surgeon never said anything to. Her. I mean, there's a lot of money. People need to realize there's a lot of money being made here. And there's an ideology behind it that's being pushed by some powerful players. But the kids are just seen as, as pawns in this. That's that's the major issue here is that all these young girls um, are absolutely victims in this. Uh, it's a point we try to make in the film is that, listen, we're not we're not anti-transgender. There is no such thing as transgender. You know, we are we feel very, very much pity for the kids especially that are getting sucked into this vortex into the trans industrial complex and we need to do everything we can to help these kids um this is not about being anti anything except anti uh the people who are making money and enforcing this on kids and not allowing them to live normal lives Mm -hmm. i think it's a it's wonderful to concentrate on young people because i others can can really see, you know, what what a vicious um, attack this is, right? So, so the victim here, when the victim is a person, a young person who is clearly not able to to make wise choices and it doesn't have either the wisdom, ne- neither the wisdom nor the experience nor the developed brain, you know, to make these decisions, it's very easy. But the transgender movement is, I think, in all its facets, whether it's what attacking children or affecting adults, I, I think it's just as damaging and has far-reaching consequences. It, f- for example, in our relationship to reality. I mean, when you see, yeah. you're watching people, I've been, I follow a lot of things um, in, in other countries. You see in Scotland, they're putting men, men rapists in women's prisons and then yeah. having huge discussions about why is she now, why is she a woman raping women? And they're literally, they're having these discussions talking about the rape, the male rapist as a woman. And you have to ally yourself to these these um, these irrealities um, yeah. in in your language, or else you can't even get in get in on the mix. You can't even talk and discuss. Um, so there's so many things like that that are happening. Okay, but that's an excellent point. I mean, not just about. Uh, places like prisons where we have or, or, you know, like how to use public bathrooms and where we have like physical danger. But even beyond that, forcing people to deny reality uh, on a sort of minute by minute basis mm-hmm. as they go through their lives. Like so what's, when you're what's little... that doing to us as a society, as a culture, exactly, that says, right? how we're living now in a world where you have to say a lie. You have to say a lie and you have to pretend yes. to believe it. And you know it's a lie and the pa- the person sitting in front of you knows it's a lie and you're all pretending. When, where does <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. That's, that's what makes this so serious. So even like even something 
you know, as seemingly innocuous as changing pronouns or, or declaring your pronouns. Well, if you're a third grader, let's say you're a third grade boy who shows up in school and you're asked to explain to your teacher, well, what gender are you? Let's have your pronouns. You are absolutely altering that little boy's view of reality, not of, of the, his kids around him, of his parents, of his father, his mother, his sister. You are changing his understanding of reality and forcing him into your dis while well, you're disconnecting him from reality, but you're forcing him into a lie. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly damaging to that to that boy, but also to society in general. Like every time you're forced to put pronouns in your bio at work, you are living an unreality. Okay. You you don't nobody gets to choose their gender. There is no such thing. Mm -hmm. See, so that's like you said, you're you're forced to think falsely. You're living in an unreality now. And that, yeah, you're you're right. Like on a society-wide basis, that's a recipe for catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It also, I think, indicates a little bit of just how diabolical this is. I mean, this is this is ultimately it is an anti-reality, anti-human, anti-God situation here that we have. Like this is this is like lies from from the garden ultimately. Um, we, you, you don't want to be a creature. You don't want to be uh, someone that was born into a situation. You want to create reality for yourself. Well, that's really a, a satanic approach to life. And I think, we, you know, we, we touch on that even a little bit in the film. I was reading Chesterton this past week, and he would never, I don't think he could have imagined the, the condition that we're in only a few decades after, after his death, right? He hasn't been gone mm -hmm. that long. He wrote in, he was writing in his book, Orthodoxy. He wrote about how faith, he was writing about faith and reason, right? So faith is, faith is faith. We know what faith is. And and our culture throughout faith, we can't, oh, we can't believe in God. That's crazy. We can only believe in the things that we can feel and touch and understand and, and categorize, right? Like we're good materialists. Yeah. Um, but he made the point, well, but that's also a kind of faith, right? So you have to, if, yeah. if you believe, if you believe that you can see something and appreciate it and categorize it and describe it and two people can see the same thing and understand the same thing, you're also believing in yourself as a rational human being and other human beings as rational human beings. So he was saying that if you throw out faith, eventually you'll have to throw out reason because both yeah. faith and reason are based on the idea that a man and a woman can see the world and 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 make assumptions and make decisions and make, and take get to conclusions right and beliefs yeah. what do you think about that do you think from what from all the from all the wonderful interviews you made and research does that do you think Chesterton was onto something oh i mean 100% this is it's an anti reason anti science <laughs> anti human um, philosophy. I think I think Chesterton also said, I think probably in, in orthodoxy as well, that in the future, the only sin will be to call green grass green. Yes, right? exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, it is, an, it is an, a, an entrance into unreality. It is to to live a lie and to not be able to explain what we all know is right in front of our face. Well, we're, you know, we're, we're, unleashing, we, we're unleashing chaos, aren't we? With this? Yeah. Well that that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. That and that was another that's another reason the movie's called Disconnected, right? Is that mm -hmm. um, we and even in the subtitle we have disconnected from your body, disconnected from your family, disconnected from reality in general. But that is the, the diabolical thing is to disconnect what God has put together, right? God is a unifier, all of reality in a sense is unified. We are meant to live in unities with our body, with our family, with our community. Um, it's all we become, we're meant in the image of God to ultimately live the beatific vision, trinity with him, right? And this is a tearing apart of all of that. Uh, it is an anti-reality, anti-family, anti-person thing that, that wants to take what God joins together and rip it apart because ultimately the devil hates reality, right? And so, yeah, reason goes right along with that. Reason, all of it. It's like, <laughs> this has nothing to do with like, follow the science, follow reason, be rational. This very anti all of those things and we and we do uh, talk about that we, we uh, dig into the philosophy of it a little bit uh, in the film as well as the science so I think you're exactly right Don you did not you did not shy away from political implications in your movie on the trailer you have our I'm sad to say Catholic <laughs> President, <Yeah. laughs> President Joe Biden uh, making his public declaration on transgender visibility day I think it's called um, and and I I know, you know, our, our listeners probably know and you know that the, the Biden administration has gone in full force 
behind the transgender movement. They are promoting it in schools, um, everywhere in the military. I mean, just everything they can do to light this on fire, they're they're doing. But different states are pushing back because, thank God, we have you know our wonderful system of states, and and we yeah. can live in different parts of the world and the different parts of our country for instance in florida where we have a wonderful right. governor and a wonderful legislature who are doing a lot to push back especially in education um why po- politically how fraught is this issue for you politically and and what can we do as voters um on, on this um yeah i mean it's a huge issue uh from everything. So for instance, um, I've been attending, uh, my kids don't go to the public school system here, but yet uh, I do my best to make those that are in the public school system aware. So you go to public school um, forums, right, Mm -hmm. meetings, and make sure that they know what's going on in their schools and that they're, um, that the parents are aware. Yeah, I mean, it is, the, the politicians make the laws, again, here in California, it's basically a sanctuary state now, for sexual abusers Mm -hmm. it's just i mean to put it bluntly that's that's what it's become um it's a sanctuary state for kids leaving their families and coming here to get their bodies mutilated so yeah we we have to we can't just sit on the sidelines you got to get involved politically and make sure that uh, as best of people we can get are in there making these laws because it makes a big difference state to state you're exactly right well, Don, I think anyone who's who's heard this interview will be rushing to find out um, how they can watch the movie. So why don't you tell us how our listeners can watch Disconnected? Yeah, so if you go to Disconnected Movie, it's Disconnected with a Y, disconnectedmovie.com. That's probably the, the one-stop shop that you need to get the links. If you, if you like to buy DVDs, get the hard copy, you can order them there. But you can also stream it online. Uh, purchase it online uh, or you can go to donjohnsonmedia.com that will also have all of the links uh, to not only that movie but uh, all my other films and books as well that you might find uh, interesting they're they're generally all connected in a, in a similar way so yeah those are the two places well thank you don and it's been a real pleasure having you and thank you for all the work that you do in trying to keep society real and out of chaos Thank you, Grace. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Gracie. So I very briefly in the introduction mentioned Communio, your organization that is taking the world by storm. But why don't you tell our listeners about Communio, what it, what's the purpose, what it's doing, and where you are in that path? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're a nonprofit ministry that seeks to equip the church to evangelize around and through promoting healthy relationships, marriages, and families, right? We, we believe uh, what John Paul can taught that the future of the world passes by way of the family. Today, sadly, uh, the, the family is in a, in a state of free fall, right? There's 31% fewer people getting married each year today than, uh, than in the year 2000. There's 61% fewer people getting married today than in the year 1970. Uh, it, it's even worse for us Catholics. It's, there are 77% fewer Catholic weddings each year. Uh, than in the year 1970. Everyone knows that uh, holy vocations, good vocations to the priesthood come from Catholic families, and there's just a lot fewer of them, statistically speaking, per capita. And, and a lot of people don't are not aware how closely tied, Gracie, how closely tied the practice of the Catholic faith, the practice of Christianity uh, and belief in Jesus is tied to to marriage. That actually, if you're a millennial and you grew up in a continuously married home, you go to church every single week at almost the exact same rate as a baby boomer who grew up in a continuously married home. Hmm. Uh, the reality, what, what's changed over the last 50 to 60 years is family structure. And as that family structure changed first, then faith practice collapsed afterwards. Uh, and so basically the fruit of the sexual revolution right now is in the culture is, is just a lot less of active faith in Jesus. 
So then we're when we when we look around at our churches and we see the empty pews, we can we can draw a direct line to the the dissolution of the family. The fact that so many people are growing up in in complicated families. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is it a is it a, a causal relationship? Am I saying that right? Causal? <laughs> is it a causal, causal relationship? It is the causal. Just, yeah. Or just correlated. Which is corollary. Yeah. That, that's always the big. Uh, some some folks ask that question often, and I I often speak about it. I, I believe the data shows that it, at least in the United States over the last sixty years, it's a causal relationship. As the family and marriages collapse, it is actually causing the collapse of faith. Uh, now, we we see this in two different ways. Okay, in our data, we 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 uh, commission a large data set in 2014 and then again in 2018. And what you see is a massive change in faith practice based on the the nature of the family you grew up in. So if you grew up in in a continuously married home, you're more likely to go to much more likely to go to church. Now nobody ever says I'm very religious and and so I chose to to come from a, a home where mom and dad stayed married. The family of origin precedes in time and place, your your likelihood of practicing the faith. And uh, we are going to be coming out uh, later this year with a large new study that looks at 20,000. It'll, it'll be uh, 20,000 completed surveys of Sunday attendees. That'll be half will be Catholic attendees, half will be Protestant. And what we're going to see, what we're already seeing on the Catholic side, for instance, uh, is about 88 percent of everybody in the pews. Uh, the final number isn't calculated, but it'll be close to that. 88% of everybody sitting in the pews uh, on Sunday grew up in an intact home. That's a massive That's number. That's massive. And very, it, it is also, you know, a minority position today. There's uh, just 46% of kids will get to their 17th birthday with a married mom and a dad. So there's just less and less people coming from that family structure. So, so we need to sing it from the rooftops that, it's all about, you know, there was a, the old famous saying by Jim, James Carville that it's it's the economy stupid. Is It was his famous saying back way uh, back in the 1990s. And, and right now you could you could essentially say the same thing about about marriage and the family. Right. So that's the origin of the collapse of faith right now. So, so it, it in, sounds, in the I'm sorry, it sounds so, like Communio starts with data. Right. So communio is very data, data driven. Like you really want to know what's actually happening on a on a on a statistical and numbers basis, not just uh, feelings and anecdotes, which, you know, are important. But right. I think you're what you're I mean, what communio is trying to do is take real information as though you the kind of information you would you would use if you were doing, you know, a study at uh, McKinsey, for instance, <laughs> and say, where yeah. is, uh, I'm going to put my finger where the problem is. First, I have to start with the real data. Yeah, that's a, that's absolutely right. And and sometimes this makes those of us uh, in the church uncomfortable uh, mm -hmm. with when you look at data. And I, I, I like to remind all the listeners that in Acts 2, somebody uh, counted that there were 3,000 people baptized that day. So so I think the Holy Spirit does also care about numbers. <laughs> the Holy and, Spirit uh, cares about numbers, yes. <laughs> right, right. And and there's no, there's, there is no uh, gospel mandate to be unsophisticated in our approach to advancing uh, faith in Jesus. So, so with that, with that as sort of prologue, we, we do, we do, we, we are responsible for, for taking the resources that God's given us and producing as much fruit from those resources as we can. And so it, a community, one of the things that we see in the church right now is 82% of Catholic parishes report spending no money each year on relationship and marriage ministry. And to me, Gracie, that's a really uh, something to be actually excited about, that, that what we're saying is that marriage is going the wrong, the wrong direction. Less and less people know how to form a healthy marriage, how to form and discern uh, relationships well enter and, and maintain a healthy Christ-centered relationship, uh, uh, and and so the church can actually the, the church can actually step in and uh, and teach when this is uh, when this is not the case, right? When mm -hmm. we can come in and and provide uh, 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 a, a real data-informed approach to marriage and relationship ministry that produces better outcomes for our young people, better outcomes for our marriages, better outcomes for our families. And so when uh, when we work with the church, it's, the idea is, is to come in and uh, uh, speak into this, what is really the, the big felt need of the 21st century, right? That, that there's a lot of uh, folks, uh, the culture is 
feeding our young people uh, and our marriages a false a false bill of goods. And and we've got the right answers, and and we can provide those answers and then and then support uh, support our marriages, support our young people, so that they can form and live a a happy and holy married life. So in in most parish churches, like in mine. When um, we hear about marriage, when we hear about marriage and homilies, it's it's talked about as a subject of theology, right? Um, yes. And it's not always, and you're saying 82% of the time, it's not an object of ministry, like an actual active aim of the parish to Correct. to help foster marriages and to, and to help people get married properly. Um, That's right. So Communio tries to uh, bridge that gap, right? Like direct the par- each individual parish towards an active ministry instead of just theology, which is important, but also an active involvement in its in parishioners' actual lived experience of marriage and relationship. Yeah, that's right. I, it, it, fundamentally, grace builds on nature. We know that. And, and so what we need to do is equip our, our, uh, the church, the individual parish can and should uh, uh, help provide a path towards living uh, marriage well, right? Uh, just as you're you're echoing, I, I often tell priests and bishops that we have to move from making marriage the object of our theology. We have to move beyond that and make it also the subject of our ministry. That that uh, we've we've got a uh, in my so I've written a book, Gracie, called Endgame: mm-hmm. The Church's mm-hmm. Strategic Move to save faith and family in America. And I would encourage any of your listeners to pick it up, uh, get a copy for their pastor. It's a very much a battle plan for the church in the 21st century. They can pick it up at endgamebook.org, endgamebook.org. And in it, I go through a a very, I go well beyond the the data that's driving the collapse of faith, although that's there. And I go into, uh, go into a strategic framework uh, to solve the crisis, right? And so, one that's proven that we we worked uh, over the course of the development of our of our program in a number of different cities. We we uh, succeeded in our work in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, over a three year period, uh, working with uh, more than fifty churches in lowering the divorce rate by twenty four percent in three years. That's and amazing, took, JP. Yeah, yeah, it was a huge move. We had independent research from the University of Virginia and Florida State. University conclude there was no explanation for that decline other than our intervention in the county. And so, so what we've done is we've we've distilled the key learnings from it and we've turned it into a church-facing, parish-facing model that that any church can grab, pull and pull a, pull of these strategies in. And um, uh, in the book, I go into there's you know there's enough research there's, to know that there's five. We know there's five interpersonal skill areas and five intrapersonal skill areas. These are the, the known and knowable relationship skill areas to have a great, healthy, thriving marriage. And there's, and, and our parishes should know about those skills, know how to teach those skills. Um, you, you, you wanna, you, you gotta uh, obliterate the idea that marriage ministry is just for people who are struggling or, or predominantly for people who are struggling. Right? When, when father goes on a spiritual retreat which he has to by canon law each year. He doesn't come when he comes back and he tells his parishioners, "I went on a spiritual retreat." Nobody nobody questions his vocation and says, "Fathers, there's something wrong. You went on a spiritual retreat." No, because in the culture of our faith, we understand that constant improvement and growing with the Lord is incredibly important for the Christian walk, and that needs to be extended to marriage as well, right? I grow in my holiness as a married man through my vocation, right? And so we need to make it normal that, you know, in, in the parish, everybody invests in their marriage. It, it, marriage ministry is for people with great marriages in the same way that if you're close to the Lord, you want to grow closer to the Lord always. No one ever stops and says, you know, I'm, I'm kind of done and growing in holiness. Uh, I think that's all I need to do now. Uh, and in the same way, that's, that's, that's how we need to approach our vocation of marriage. We want to grow uh, a, a deeper uh, in holiness by growing uh, more in love with our spouse uh, over time and investing in the skills and in the practices necessary to be a great husband or a great, a great, uh, an even greater wife. Even if we are already have a great marriage, uh, it's it's for truly for uh, for everyone who is who's already married, and it's also for those who are 
uh, amongst our single people, how do we equip our single people to live single life well that can, uh, for instance, lead to, uh, for those called to the vocation of marriage, can lead to healthy marriages, uh, for those who who, who uh, uh, may not, uh, uh, may never be able to enter married life, uh, uh, that they can still have great relationships and mm-hmm. close friendships. A lot of these skills, the skills that allow you to have a great marriage, allow you to have great friendships as well. And, and, um, and there's a lot that's transferable there that can, that can, uh, that the church can step in and, and provide through active ministry. So JP, I'm listening to this and it sounds amazing, but I'm thinking about it through the through the lens of my my parish, my parochial vicar, no, the parish priest, our pastor. Yep. And sure. he um so we're building a new church. We have a, <laughs> we have like 17 masses a day apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're all packed and there's uh, the CCD and there's the par- the parochial the the parochial school, which is a huge headache all the time, of course, like any big organization. There's fundraising. Where does um, a busy priest um, like Father JC at my at my thriving church, where does he how does he approach this and how can Communio help him make a thriving relationship ministry so so first I, i'll just note that I, I jokingly say that i'm not just uh, i guess the you know the hair club president and i'm also a client so so, <laughs> and this is, so I, I say that my brother is a catholic pastor and uh, we work with over 170 churches around the country and i work very closely with my brother in his parish where he's got a per, one of the perhaps the largest uh, uh by, by sunday attendance parishes in the diocese of, of palm beach and He's got a parish school, huge parish school, and he's got all of these constraints, right? The, the a key here is is the question is is, is first uh, we we want father to think of uh, of a data informed full circle relationship ministry as a tool to evangelize and grow the church. What we want to do is event. At the end of the day, what we are about is is helping more souls encounter Jesus, encounter faith, faith in Jesus, and grow the church. Uh, right now, post COVID, there's less and less, even at your busy church. Statistically speaking, uh, we're seeing anywhere between 15 and 40 percent reductions on average of Sunday attendance today to pre COVID levels. So there's a great need to evangelize. The question is, how do you evangelize? And historically, as Catholics, we've always since the beginning, evangelized around felt needs, right? Jesus healed the sick, healed the lame, uh, provided some help to some very clear felt need, and then folks followed him, and he could share uh, the truth of the gospel with them. And, and so great missionaries do that today. And in our 21st century, we don't have the we don't have sub-Saharan poverty, but we do have a great poverty in the lack of, of healthy relationships and healthy marriages. So, so one, we think this is the great felt need of the 21st century. Uh, number, and so then number two, if that's understood, right? If I'm a, if I'm a pastor on mission with zeal to win souls, then the data says this is the most high leveraged way to win souls. So then the question is how, how should I best do it? How best do I prioritize? We explain that this is, we should not think of this as sort of, uh, uh, one, one, item on a bookshelf of many different ministries within the church that actually uh, uh, my vocation, right? Most people at a Catholic parish, most Sunday attendees are married. That's just what the data says, right? So how are my vocation, my ability to grow in holiness? I do not have a vocation to be a to be a Catholic man. I have a vocation to be a married man as a married, as a married Catholic man, right? So I need to be, what is my parish doing? What the question for Father for Father JC or anybody is, what is my parish doing right now to allow my people to live their vocation and grow in their vocation, right? Uh, Holy Mother Church knows that for a father, for a priest to grow in his vocation, he needs to say the daily, he needs to do the divine office, he needs to do the daily liturgy, and he needs to go on a spiritual retreat every day, right? Like that's the that's the basic minimum for the rule of life. But what is the rule of life for us married people, right? And so we have to challenge our, we have to challenge our priests, we have to challenge our bishops, and it, respectfully. And it is what we know this already. We already know this uh, for for the uh, for those who have who uh, have a vocation of holy orders. So so all we need to do is apply what we already know and what we already do in, in helping the parish to architect a rule, a rule of life and pour into this vocation, the vocation of marriage so that I can grow in holiness. And right now, 
if if Father JC or any any pastor is it needs to needs to we all need to be introspective and say, well, what am I doing right now to help my people grow in their grow in holiness through their vocation? And if the answer is nothing, then that that should convict us, and and we need to alter the way that we are allocating our our, our dollars, allocate the way it needs to it, it needs to challenge us to change the way we allocate our time uh, as a parish. So. Well, thank you, JP, and thank you for giving us your time today. Thanks so much, Gracie. Have a great day. God bless you. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. And now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy to have a chance to ponder with you the consequential conversation the Lord wants to have with each of us this Sunday. As we enter into the most famous homily he ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, which charts the distinctive way that Jesus, out of love for us, wants us to live. This Sunday, Jesus gathers us around him like he did his original listeners on the mountain, presents to us the way to heaven, happiness, and holiness, precisely so that we may choose to follow him on it. The path that he shows us stands in stark contrast to the path that the vast majority of people in the world believe will make us happy. Jesus' words present us with the choice on which our lives hinge. Let's listen to him as if we're hearing him for the first time. The world tells us that to be happy, we have to be rich. Jesus says, rather, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. The world tells us that we're happy when we don't have a concern in the world. Jesus says, on the other hand, blessed are those who are so concerned with others that they mourn over their own and others' miseries, for they will be comforted by him eternally. Worldly know-it-alls say you have to be strong and powerful to be happy. Jesus, in contrast, retorts, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The spiritually worldly increasingly shout, to be happy, you've got to have all your sexual fantasies fulfilled. And our culture promotes people like Hugh Hefner and promiscuous Hollywood vixens as those who have it made. Jesus, however, says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. The world preaches you're happy when you accept yourself. It espouses an I'm okay, you're okay brand of moral relativism. It advocates a culture of comfort. Jesus says, though, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness, for his grace and justification, for they will be filled. The world says you're happy when you don't start a fight but finish it. And people from professional wrestlers to boxers to generals to armchair or backseat presidents shout no mercy. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. And blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Our American culture increasingly says you're happy when everyone considers you nice, when you don't have an enemy in the world. Jesus says, rather, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and blessed are you when people revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, for your reward will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, the Lord says who are poor in spirit, gentle, merciful, who mourn, who care for what is right, who are pure in heart, who make peace, who are persecuted. Blessed are you. Jesus exalts those whom the world generally regards as weak. He basically says to us, as St. John Paul II once said to young people on the Mount of the Beatitudes, Blessed are you who seem to be losers, because you are the real winners. The kingdom of heaven is yours. But in this, Jesus is essentially beckoning us to follow him because he is the face of the Beatitudes. Jesus was poor himself, so poor that he didn't have a place to lay his head. And his physical poverty led to a poverty in spirit, in which he treasured God the Father and his kingdom as his greatest gift. Jesus mourned. He wept over Jerusalem, which failed to recognize the path to true peace, whose residents so often killed those God sent to indicate the path to them. He likewise wept over the death of his friend Lazarus. Jesus was meek. He identified himself as meek and humble of heart, told us to learn him in that meekness and humility. Jesus hungered and thirsted for righteousness, saying that his very hunger, his very food, was to do the will of the one who sent him and to complete his work. Jesus was merciful, as we see in the episode with the woman caught in adultery, with Peter after the resurrection, with the sinner who washed his feet with her tears, with the Samaritan woman, with the paralyzed man lowered through the roof by his friend, with the centurion whose son was dying, with the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was ill, and so many more. 
Jesus is pure in heart. He taught that out of our heart flows our thoughts and our deeds. Out of the good tree of a good heart flows good fruit. On the contrary, he added, it is with, from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. A pure heart like that of Jesus sees and loves God the Father and his will in every situation. Jesus was a peacemaker. He was, in fact, the Prince of Peace who effectuated a definitive peace treaty between God and man and signed it in his own blood. During the Last Supper, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. And he sent out his apostles to be true peacemakers, announcing this peace, his peace, to the world. Jesus was persecuted for the sake of righteousness. From the scribes and the Pharisees, to those in his hometown of Nazareth, to the false witnesses at his trial, to the Roman soldiers, to the passers-by on Calvary, to Herod, to Pilate, to the thief on his left, so many reviled him, persecuted him, and uttered all kinds of evil against him falsely. But he rejoiced. Because this was the path of our salvation, and it made possible a great reward for us in heaven. So Jesus teaches us the way of the Beatitudes, the path of happiness, holiness, and heaven, not just by his words, but by his actions in very person. In this, as in everything else he taught, he never says merely, do what I say, but always follow me. Jesus is the Beatitude. Looking at him, St. John Paul II once said, you see what it means to be poor in spirit, gentle and merciful, to mourn, to care for what is right, to be pure in heart, to make peace, even to be blessed while persecuted. This is why he has the right to say, come follow me. Yes, while Jesus beckons us to follow him, we have to ask whether we trust him enough to do so. To believe in Jesus means to believe in what he says and to trust that following him along the path of the Beatitudes will truly lead us to the happiness Jesus promises and for which our hearts long. It means to put the, that faith into action and follow Jesus along that challenging path. The beatific path, we have to admit, is rather sparsely trod. There's a reason for it. Just like the devil tried to tempt Adam and Eve in the garden and tried to tempt Jesus in the desert, so he tries to tempt us by pointing us to another path. Strive to convince us that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, that he's not in touch with the real world, that his principles will in fact lead us down an unfulfilling dead end. He's got so many to bite on the fruit of counterfeit beatitudes and seek to be rich, the life of the party, strong and powerful, satiated, a sexual tiger, feared, praised, and not to be crossed. But this is just one more lie from the father of lies. Despite the fact that the counterfeit beatitudes seem to promise happiness, they inexorably lead, whether gradually or quickly, to sadness and despair. Those who are rich in spirit, who think that money will bring them happiness, realize often toward the end of their life that that is the one thing money can't buy. If the pursuit of money has made them greedy and materialistic, they will be among the most miserable of people. Those who are impure of heart, addicted to porn or physical pleasure, experience an agonizing form of slavery, frequently look back on their deeds and see just how much pain they have caused to others by using them to satisfy their own appetites. Those who are not peacemakers, but who quarrel, nag, and harp on others' defects, recognize one day to their dismay that they have alienated those who are closest to them, and that in making their points and supposedly winning their arguments, they have lost what is far more important, other people. Those who fail to show mercy because of their unwillingness to forgive experience an inner cancer that slowly eats them alive. Finally, those who are not willing to suffer for Christ's sake, who out of a fear of upsetting others fail to pass on the faith, often discover a deep sense of emptiness for betraying Christ, which is a pain worse than that of betraying a friend or a spouse. That remorse is compounded by seeing the pain in others whose suffering could have been avoided had someone had the guts to preach the gospel before they went down the destructive path of sin and addiction. If we're bold enough to challenge the devil's bogus beatitudes by even our own human experience, we recognize that, they all, all, that all they deliver is a sham and shallow form of happiness, which when finally exposed leads to sadness and even despair. It's Christ and Christ alone who has the words of eternal life. And it's Christ and Christ alone who shows us the path to the happiness for which our hearts long, for which he made them to long. Christ this Sunday will engage us anew in the conversation about the way we are to live and then enter into us to help us live by them from the inside. Let's get ready to make his words not only consequential in our life, but by the joyful, bold, and contagious way we imitate Jesus in living them. Make them consequential too in the lives of those around us. 
Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com, and you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy, and you go with our prayers. 